The church is not ready for revival. The church is not ready for revival. I'm including this church. You say, well, how can that be, Brother Dave? We're, we're fasting, we're praying. And everything. Well, you can do all those things and still not be ready. So let's, let's get into the Word of God tonight. And let's believe the Lord to speak to our hearts. The church is not ready for revival. By the way, visitors, welcome. The only thing we want you to experience here is the manifest presence of Jesus. You won't go out here talking about the music. You won't be talking about the preaching. You'll be talking about, I met Jesus there. I felt his presence. That's all that we ask. Heavenly Father, I need you. I need you, Holy Spirit, to come upon me with the unction, the anointing that is yours. I'm just a vessel. I'm a body. Lord, come upon this body. Come upon this mind and the spirit. Cleanse me. Sanctify me. Let there be nothing between us, O oh God. Let there be a clear channel. Sanctify me. Purge me for this moment. Thank you for the cleansing of the blood of Jesus. We take your authority over every principality and power of darkness, over anything that would hinder the light from coming forth in the darkness. Speak to this church. Speak to me in the process. Lord, let this not be just another message. Let it have its mark in our hearts. Change our thinking. Change the way we pray. Change the way we approach you, O oh God. And instill faith in our hearts, I pray. In Jesus' name, Lord, I need you. I acknowledge it. Amen. The church is not ready for revival. Now, you know, as well as I do, there are two kinds of churches in the world today. There's the dead, cold, formal church. That dead, cold, formal church, God says, is not only dead, it's twice dead, and you're going to pluck it up by the roots. Now, God can't bless that church with revival because God doesn't send His Spirit to those who don't welcome Him. And there are many churches in America today that don't want the Holy Ghost, believe it or not. I've been in some of those churches, I've preached in them. They, are, they have a form of godliness, the Bible says, with no power. I have been in churches, literally, these are various denominational churches, and, and the pastor would read the cross and switchblade this a number of years ago, and they'd invite me to the pulpit, and they knew I had a Pentecostal background, that I talked about the Holy Ghost, and they read my book about the Holy Ghost changing lives through the cross and switchblade, and uh, I could see them sitting there while I'm preaching, and when the Spirit of the Lord would come on me, they'd get so nervous and go way down in their seats, and when people would start weeping, that really scared them, and if I'd give an invitation, they'd come up. Often, as soon as I had a, took a breath, they would jump up. And the first thing they want, everybody off their knees and out the door as fast as they could. Unless the Holy Ghost do something strange and out of order. I've had that happen a number of times. It has so angered me. And, and, and how men who are supposed to be walking in the Spirit do not welcome him. Afraid some strange manifestation, something strange. Folks, the Holy Ghost... He blows where he chooses. He does what he wants. But we have, we, have, we have people who, we have pastors and churches who do not want any moving of the Holy Spirit. That's the dead, cold, formal church. But there is another church in the world today. That's the holy remnant church that's given holy to Jesus. No compromise with the world. Consisting of people who pray and fast and seek the face of God. Now, I'm concerned with the righteous Holy Ghost Church tonight. That's the only church with a possibility of receiving an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Uh, I don't usually use the word revival because revival means the resurrection of that which threatens to become a corpse. If, if you revive somebody, it means they've already passed out. And I don't think we have passed out in this church. So I don't like to talk about revival. I like to talk about an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. But I use the word revival because that's a term most people understand. I'm telling you now that I don't believe that even the true church is ready for the great outpouring of the Holy Ghost promised. It's not ready yet. A righteous church can be engrossed in prayer. We can call you to pray. You can pray for weeks and months. You can fast. You can cry out and you can supplicate before the Lord with tears and strong crying and still not be ready for revival or an awakening of the Holy Ghost. He's not going to waste his spirit on those who refuse to repair themselves. And I think it's absolutely necessary to go into the Word of God and find out how God's people prepared themselves and what the prophets say 
And folks, there are some promises that are on call right now. They are on call. They are ready to be fulfilled. And God's just waiting for people prepared to lay hold of those promises. We're going to talk about them tonight. <clears throat> There's a biblical pattern. Now, of course, God's Spirit comes uh, on people occasionally that are not worthy. There have been records of the Holy Ghost falling in various tribes and around the world on those who weren't expecting it. And God just, out of His grace and mercy, sends the Holy Ghost and there's a resurrection, there's a breathing, and life comes. But usually the pattern is that God has set a standard, He has shown us a way, and He works through a prepared people. Now I want to give you three valid reasons tonight why I believe the church, the true church, is not yet ready quite ready for revival, or an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Now listen to me closely. This is burning in my heart, because I'm just as guilty as anybody else. And I've asked God to deal with me on these three issues. All right, issue number one. The church is not ready for revival, because we are pretty much convinced that society has just about sinned away its day of grace. That America has so grieved God, for example that it's past remedy, and there's no hope. Now, folks, for the past 10 years, I was nearly convinced in my heart by the terrible moral landslide in America and the horrible intensity of sin, I was pretty much convinced that nothing was left, no other option God had but judgment. And I have preached the impending judgment of God for the past uh, probably 15 years, but more intensely in the past 10 years, preaching about the coming judgments of the Lord. And I, I believe that with all of my heart. I've not changed my thinking on that at all. But it's absolutely possible. Yes, I know it's possible for societies to send away their day of grace. God waits patiently. He sends prophets just like he is here in America. There are many prophetic, prophetic voices in the land warning of coming judgment. But a day finally comes, and you find it all through church history, a day finally comes when God said it's enough. It happened in time of Noah. 120 days of God's striving. 120 years of God's striving. And then he said that's enough. And God wiped out humanity other than those who were in the ark. It happened in Sodom and Gomorrah when God counted the days and he said, your, your, your cup of iniquity is full, your sins have ascended to heaven. And God, that's enough. And he wiped out Sodom and Gomorrah and all the surrounding towns and villages around Sodom and Gomorrah. It's happened, it happened in Jerusalem when God in his patience, even Christ walked the streets and wept and he warned them of what was coming. And 70 years after Jesus, the uh, the city of Jerusalem fell and was burned and thousands were murdered in a horrible holocaust in Jerusalem. God said, that's enough. Now, God sent Jeremiah to the gates of the temple and he had this solemn cry. God said, go and preach this message. And Jeremiah cried. God said to Jeremiah, go now unto my place, which is at Shiloh. He's telling Israel, think back to Shiloh where I... Set my name at first and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. <clears throat> Therefore, will I do unto this house, which is called by my name, wherein ye trust, and unto the place I give unto you and to your fathers, <clears throat> as I've done to Shiloh. Therefore, pray not for this people, neither lift up your cry, don't pray for them, neither make intercession to me, for I'll not hear you any more. God said there comes a time when you can stop praying because my patience is gone and I have determined judgment. So don't pray for these people. God told Jeremiah, I'm, I'm going to take my spirit, I'm going to take it out from the east gate, and I'm going to just lift it from the house of God and it's going to be just like Shiloh. Go back to see what happened at Shiloh. That's where Eli, remember, the spirit of God departed and Ichabod was written over the door. And God says, any other nation, any other people that reach this point, there comes a time when it's enough. In fact, Ezekiel had the same message given to his heart by the Lord. Son of man, when the Lord, when the land sins grievously against me trespassing, 
Then will I stretch out my hand upon it. I will break the staff of the bread thereof. That reading, that means uh, economic depression. And I'll send famine upon it. And I'll cut off man and beast from it. And though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they shall deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. They shall deliver neither their sons nor their daughters. They only shall be delivered, but the Lord, but the land shall be desolate. If these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they couldn't pray a revival. They couldn't pray or not praying of the Holy Ghost. They couldn't even pray for more time. And God says, I determine judgment. That's it. All the praying people in the world can't change my mind. Now, that is very clear in Scripture. <clears throat> you study the prophets carefully, <clears throat> and you will see this pattern all through. God says, I've given Shiloh as an example. And that's for every coming generation, including our generation. Now, when I see what God did to Noah's generation, when I see what God did to Sodom and to Jerusalem, I begin to de look at America and I begin to deduct in my mind, and I begin to reason with God, well, Lord, you destroyed uh, Noah's generation with just a fraction of the violence that we have. Oh, God, there's no way that they were killing 25 million babies. There was no way that they were murdering like we are in our streets. There's no way such widespread violence that we have. We're a million times worse than Noah's generation. You destroyed them. You judged them. Lord, there were, uh, there were sodomites and homosexuals roaming the streets of Sodom. Oh God. We, we have just in one parade here, just one parade of naked homosexuals and act up, uh, violent homosexuals. We have a half million sometimes, more than the population of Sodom in one march. And I say, oh God, if you destroyed them, how are you going to spare us? And Lord, in Jerusalem, there was apostasy and there was idolatry, but that's one little city. We have a whole nation like that. And how do you spare us? And as if, as of this day, right now, January 8th, 1995, the fierce judgments of God have been held back from America. You know that. Our economy is still booming, they say. Try to tell that to the unemployed. All I see in the paper, uh, one, one company after another laying people off. But you see our gross national product is increasing. The automobile factories are putting out more cars than any time in history, record-breaking pace. And in New York Times today, it says inflation is holding steady, and we are in a, a baby boom, they call it, and everything is looking good. But you know, in spite of that, why isn't it bringing a sense of security to the people? Why is it that everybody still has a feeling of something hanging in the air and that there's something about to happen? Even the worst uh, sinner, even the secular mind, they are not in, nobody feels secure. It's just like they're waiting for the shoe to fall. There is a total lack of security, a sense of security in the land. And we know, this nation knows it deserves judgment. There's not a sinner on the street here in New York that doesn't know that this city is headed for judgment and deserves judgment. You and I know America deserves judgment. But there's a sense everywhere hanging there that we're on borrowed time. How many sense that on your job or wherever you go? People feel like they're on borrowed time. I don't believe that we're ready for a revival when we have a gnawing sense in us that there's no more hope, that we have sinned away our day of grace, and that there's nothing left but judgment. How can you have faith for God to do anything in this last day if you believe it's all over? Now, this is something you've got to see. God's been dealing with me on this. There was a time 15 years ago when I saw the coming calamities, and I was telling people, run from your cities and go get five acres somewhere and, and, and uh, store up food. Because I, I had given up on the country. 
We can't pray in faith for a great outpouring of God's Holy Spirit until we're convinced that God still wants to pour out His Spirit. That He still wants to save a great... He, there's a harvest yet. Why hasn't Jesus come yet? Why has America not been judged yet? Folks, we have a major judgment. We've got a plague in the land. We've got new diseases coming up that nobody has been able to describe. Some of them coming up that are going to be worse than AIDS. Some diseases that can kill in 24 hours. We've got some terrible signs of judgment. But on the whole, we, we are still blessed. The Bible says Jesus is waiting patiently for the harvest. He's waiting. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I want you to go to Isaiah, the 50th chapter where the heart of my message is. Isaiah 50. First two verses. How many want to hear from God's Word? You're going to hear it. Thus saith the Lord, Where's the bill of your mother's divorcement, whom I have put away? Of which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities have you sold yourself, and for your transgressions is your mother put away. Wherefore, when I came, was there no man? When I called, was there none to answer? Is my hand shortened at all, that it cannot redeem? Or, I have no, or have I no power to deliver? Behold, at my rebuke I dry up the sea. I make the rivers a wilderness. The fish stinketh because there's no water and dieth for thirst. All right, look at me, please. In these two verses, we have the key to what I'm preaching about tonight. God is saying to Judah, now remember this, God has already divorced Israel and gave her a bill of divorcement. I, I read it to you. Wherefore, all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, and I put her away and gave her a bill of divorce. Jeremiah 3, 8. It said, Jeremiah said, or, or Israel sinned against me, <clears throat> and I divorced her. Israel's divorced from me. But folks, even though he was divorced from Israel, he had a heart for Judah. And he, he, was, he is saying to Judah, oh, by the way, for Israel, even though he was divorced, listen to the mercy of God. He says, return to me. O backsliding Israel, and I will not cause my anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep my anger forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity, that you have transgressed against the Lord thy God. Even though he is divorced from Israel, even though Israel had sinned grievously, just like America, and even though God was divorced, he said, if you'll just come back and return, acknowledge you transgressed against me, I'll receive you back. But see, Judah now has walked away from God. Judah does not learn a lesson. He, she sees the judgment of God on Israel for having been divorced from God. And now the Lord comes to Judah. Judah is a wife that's cheated on the Lord, so to speak. She's walked away. She's got her own little place now, her little haunt of adultery and fornication, and she's playing the part of a harlot. And God comes to Judah. And, and cries out, Where is the bill of your mother's divorcement? Whom I have put away. Of which of my creditors it to, to whom I have sold you? God has said, God came to Judah and says, Show me your divorce papers. Prove to me that I ever divorced you. I didn't divorce you. You walked away from me. It's your own sin that's caused this estrangement between us. I loved you all the time. I did nothing to grieve you. I did nothing to hurt you. I've loved you. You saw what Israel did to me. You saw how Israel, I gave Israel divorce papers, but I have loved you and I have not left you. And here you see God saying, when, wherefore I came, I called. Here is the Lord going out in the streets, going out after Judah in the very den of iniquity, in the den of harlotry. And he's calling. He said, I'm coming after you. And you're telling everybody there's no hope that I've divorced you. That there's no hope that we can't get together anymore. That there'll never be a time of love. He said, but I've come to call you. I've come back to you. 
And folks, that's exactly what I see God doing yet in America. God said, show me your divorce papers. Show me where I walked away from you. Folks, God has not lifted the Holy Ghost yet from New York City or from America. The Holy Ghost is here working everywhere. He's working all over America, yet He's still wooing, He's still calling. And He says, I came to you, I called you. He's calling through me, He's calling through this pastor and the pastor of this church. He's calling through men of God who have gone their face seeking Him. He's calling this nation to repentance, calling Him back to His own heart. He said, I've not divorced you. You see, if you come to the place where you believe God's divorced America, divorced this land, divorced this city, you can't pray in faith. God spoke to my heart. I have got to believe and you have got to believe that God is still coming by His Spirit. He is wooing people up and down these streets. While you and I sit in this church tonight, the Holy Ghost is wooing people all over this city and all over the land. He said, I came. No, there was no answer. We'll get into that in just a moment. <clears throat> there was no answer. God still loved Israel. And folks, God still loves this nation, though we're getting very, very close to what I call the dread release. There, you can read it in the Old Testament many times. Your wound is incurable. Pray no more. Thank God we still have time. I pray for faith right now in your heart and mine that we will not, even as, as much as we see of the iniquity of this city, we will not give up on it. Lord says, when I came, when I called, where were those who would respond? Where were those who would answer my call to return? Now, folks, that's what this week of prayer is about. That's what all of our praying intercession is. When God comes to a city, and folks, I believe this with all my heart, God didn't need just another building. He didn't need just another full house in the city. He came here, and he's waking up other churches, and he has a purpose to it. It has to do with his last call. It has to do with his very divine purpose. Folks, you're sitting right now in, in, in a very clear example of the wooing of the Holy Ghost. He wooed you. He stirred you. He took you out of your apostasy and your backsliding. You were compromising many of your living in sin, and God shook you up. He put the finger in your face, and he said, come, I love you, and you responded. And the same Holy Ghost that brought you wants to bring a whole multitude. Hallelujah. And folks, when the Lord comes, we've got to say, here I am, Lord, send me. Now, the second issue, here's the reason why I believe the church is not ready for revival. We're not ready for revival because we're overwhelmed by the darkness that settled over our nation, and we're overwhelmed by the fury of the enemy. There is a fury, an intensity in sinners today, such as in no other generation. And there is a darkness that's falling over this land, and the Scripture says, Behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness shall cover the people. A gross darkness means a darkness that you can feel. It's so intense, so widespread, the darkness is thickening all over the land. There's a darkness. Folks, there's a spiritual darkness in this city. It's in the hearts of men. It's in the hearts of men. You can fly over into uh, Newark Airport or you fly over the city into LaGuardia or to Kennedy Airport and, and you look at all, you, you see all the lights and you see the skyscrapers and you, you don't get the feel, you don't get the sense of the darkness because the lights are just blaring on all sides. But get down off the plane, get in the cab, come in, walk down Broadway and you feel the darkness. The darkness is heavy and it's getting heavier. The spiritual darkness blinding the hearts and minds of people. But you know, the Bible says God has a part in that darkness. Give glory to the Lord, Jeremiah 13, 16. Give glory to the Lord your God before He caused darkness and before your feet stumble in the dark on the dark mountains. And while you look for light, He turns it into the shadow of death and He makes it gross darkness. He makes it gross darkness. You see, when people are set on their sin, 
when they reject God and they are so given to their sin, driven to darkness, the Bible says. There's a darkness allowed by the Spirit of God that falls over the hearts and minds of men. Pastor Carter speaks about the blindness that comes. David said of the wicked, let their eyes be darkened that they see not. And they shall look upon the earth, unto the earth, and behold, trouble and darkness, dimness and anguish. They shall be driven to darkness. And folks, you, if you don't believe that that's what's happening now, the devil has come down with great wrath, knowing his time is short, and he's driving his people to iniquity. They are driven. Look at their eyes as they, they're on their way to make their connection. Look at their eyes when they stumble out of the bars. Look at their eyes as they're running to and fro looking for their pleasure. Look at their eyes. You can feel the darkness. They are driven to darkness, the scripture says. Folks, I came to New York City 35 years ago. There were places in the city, even in Harlem, 40 years ago, they didn't even lock the doors. When you compare the iniquity today with what we saw 40 years ago, 35, 40 years ago, the darkness is a million times thicker than it was then. It's incredible. I remember 35 years ago, I first came here, uh, I traveled all the United States in meetings. I, I would go out every weekend all over the United States, and I would warn people in Iowa and in Missouri and Oklahoma and all the southern states and I would, I would go to some of the small towns and cities and there'd be thousands of people coming. I, I was warning them that drugs would come and sweep over the land and that even the smallest town would be affected. There'd be pushers in their schools in the smallest towns. I warned of homosexuals parading the streets naked. I, I warned of nudity on television. And I was, you thought I had come from Mars. I was ridiculed. I had pastors rebuke me. I had people literally come after my meeting and said, no way, God will never let that happen to America. Now they call me a prophet. <laughs> Forty years later. You know why? Because some of those same people rebuked me. They're sitting in front of that Babylonian idiot box watching R-rated movies. They're watching the very nudity I prophesied. They're, some of those people rebuke me. Their own kids and grandkids. They're grandparents now and their grandkids are on drugs. I'm going to ask you a question. You know the darkness that's coming. And folks, if it's this bad, imagine what's going to be like 10 years from now. Should the Lord tarry? Can you imagine the darkness in this city? The darkness falling over the land when you have homosexuals now in the highest government offices taking power. When you see the darkness coming from all sides, folks, the message is this. God's people must never be intimidated by the darkness. They must not be intimidated by the fury of the enemy. Do you think for one minute that the darkness is going to diminish the light? Do you think the darkness is going to quail and squash the light of the gospel of Jesus? I don't care how dark it gets. The Bible says he's going to rise and shine in the darkness. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For the Lord knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. And the people that walk in darkness shall see a great light dwell in the land of the shadow of death. Upon them the light shall shine. We're in the shadow of death, a land of death, a land of darkness. But he said that's where he's going to shine his light the brightest. Folks, we are not to be overwhelmed by any darkness. I don't care how many homosexuals in their gay parades will look in your face and curse your Christ. I don't care how many Muslim temples they build in this land. I don't care how wild it gets on the streets. I don't care. Yes, we care, but the darkness that's coming, no matter how intense, no matter what happens, will never stop the light. Yeah. 
We can expect God in the worst darkness to bring forth the most glorious light. Isaiah 61 and 2, Arise, shine, for the light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and the kings will come to the brightness of thy rising. Glory be to God. He says, in the midst of the darkness, I'm going to come forth with bright light. A light is shining on Times Square. And it's not the light of Broadway. It's the light of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Ghost. Church, get your eyes off the darkness. Get your eyes off the sin. Get your eyes off the fury of those that are, are so blatant and so uh, violent today. Get your eyes off of that. It's not going to stop the light. We are not going home in the darkness. We're going home clouded with light. Shining, effusing with light. Hallelujah. You've got to believe when you come to this church, you are on fire and you are light and everywhere you go in this darkness, you are a candle. Not only a candle, some of you are going to be a thousand watt bulb shining everywhere you go. Hallelujah. Thirdly, the church is not ready for revival because of a weak faith in God's willingness and power to save wicked, vile sinners. Now, you say, well, that's not the case here. Now, see, God put his finger right on the problem with Judah. They doubted his willingness and power to redeem and save a people that were so entrenched in apostasy and idolatry. In fact, according to Jeremiah eighteen twelve, they said there's no hope. So we will walk after our own plans and we will everyone do the imagination of his evil heart. They, they said, uh, we're too great a sinner. We, we have gone too far. There's no turning back. This, this is what Judah, this estranged wife, has said in her heart. Well, I walked away from him. I've left him on my own volition. And now I'm deep in my sin, so deep I can't get out. It's hopeless. It's hopeless. And folks, I still have to fight with this. God helps me on it. More and more it's being less of a problem. But after all the years when I, where I've seen guys like Nikki Cruz and Sonny and all of these, Israel, and all these gang leaders and drug addicts saved, and, and hundreds and hundreds have been saved, and then I'll suddenly be on the street and I'll be face to face with somebody that's half crazy, high, drunk, cursing. And I'll I'll say, I want to pray with you. You need Jesus. And the head will go down. But there's something in my heart. I said, oh God, I know you saved Nikki. I know you saved Israel. I know you've saved hundreds. But this one? (laughs) This one? And there's something nagging. I said, oh God, this guy's hopeless. This guy is hopeless. Some of you, look at your family. Some of you, you may be married to an atheist, sister. And you look at that man and he is so mean and he's so godless. And there's something in you say, oh, I know God's saving all around me. I see people getting saved, but my, my husband's different or my boy is different. My daughter's different. My daughter's so hard. My family's so hard. My family's different. You know, God comes to Judah. Judah sitting in her hopelessness and in her adultery and in her harlotry. And, and he says to her, I, I'm coming to you, I'm calling you. And I'm asking you, is my hand short at all that it cannot redeem? That means short means cut off, chopped off. He, he says, tell me when the enemy chopped off my hand. And that's what he's saying to the church, he's saying to us. Come on, church. You know my right hand opened up the Red Sea. You know my right hand has kept the promises faithful all through this book. You've seen that I saved to the uttermost. Tell me, first of all, when did I divorce you? I didn't divorce you. I still love you. I'm coming after you. Now you say it's hopeless. Tell me, when did the devil chop off my mighty arm? When did God get chopped off? When did I lose my power to redeem? To save. He said, 
Do I have no power to deliver? He said, church, when did I lose my power? You talk about all the revivals in the past and all the things I've done. I've stirred whole nations. When did I lose that power? Tell me when. What date? Give me the date and the time and the place. When did I lose my power? Folks, that has to grip our hearts. Oh, God, you can save anybody. You can save Wall Street. You can save the worst homosexual. You can save any Muslim in this city. You can save my family. You can save anybody. Your arm is not short. You can deliver and redeem anybody. You see, we're not ready for revival when we still limit God. He's not willing that your family perish. I don't care if your sister, your brother, your unsaved loved one has rejected every call you've ever made. They've turned you away. They think you're fanatic or they think you're crazy. I don't care if it's gone on for 25 years. Don't you dare give up. Don't you dare limit God. Don't you dare think that his hand's been chopped off. Hallelujah. See, when the Spirit was outpoured in Jerusalem... At the beginning, thousands were saved. Multitudes were saved all at one time. Multitudes came. And they were added deity to the church such as should be added. And folks, in recent years, when the Holy Ghost has been poured out, like in China, reports coming out of China are incredible. Uh, you see, if Jesus is coming soon, and he's looking for a harvest, and he, he prophesies that multitudes are going to be saved, even from the land of Sinem, which is China, in Isaiah 49... 12, there's a prophecy clearly that multitudes are coming from Sinan. Sino is China. And God's doing that right now. Multitudes are being saved. The same is beginning to happen now in parts of India. That, that's happening uh, in Russia right now. And God has to do that. He just, if he's, there's going to be a great harvest. He's just going to have to come down on nations powerfully and bring multitudes into the kingdom. But usually... God works, and especially here through the church, He says He's going to work one at a time and two at a time. I'm going to read to you Jeremiah. Just listen, Jeremiah 3.14. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord. And this is in the same chapter. For I am married to you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I'll bring you to Zion. Now, folks... In this next week of prayer, when we're praying and seeking God, yes, we're going to pray for Mongolia, we'll pray for China, we'll pray for India, we'll pray for nations. Yes, we'll pray that God uh, sweep many into his kingdom through outpouring to the Holy Spirit. But folks, I believe God wants you to focus in on your family. If you really believe Jesus is about to come, you're going to, you're, there's nothing... You can have nothing else but this urgency in you. Because one day soon you're going to stand before God. And you and I have to answer for standing in the gap. We've got to pray and lay hold of the horns of the altar of God. We've got to pray, God, send conviction on my family. Save my son, save my daughter. Folks, the pastors themselves can't do it. You've got to pray such conviction on them that when they do come to this church, no matter what's preached from the pulpit, God will have so wooed them by His Spirit, they'll be prepared to receive. You can break down the strongholds of the devil in their life. Pulling down the stronghold of drugs and alcohol and apostasy and idolatry. You can break down those strongholds through your prayers. There was a, in closing... I was thinking, there was a popular song a number of years ago. Raindrops keep falling on my head. That's exactly what we're going to pray. He said, you're going to come last days as rain, the latter rain. Pray, Holy Ghost, raindrops on your family. They'll be walking around, no, don't even know what's hit them. The, the rain is going to fall. Pray, oh God, send some drops on my son, some drops on my wife. Put raindrops on the head. Holy Ghost raindrops. Convict them. Save them. 
Ask ye the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make great clouds and give them showers of rain. You can pray a thunderstorm over your house, over your family. God send lightning and thunder and rain on that house. Rain conviction. Is my hand short? They can't redeem? Have I no power to deliver? Do you remember these three things I said? Very quickly. Do you believe God still wants to have mercy on America and in New York City? How many believe that? Do you believe the Holy Ghost is still wooing? Do you believe He's not yet divorced us? All right, that's number one. Settle it. God wants to pour out the Holy Ghost. He's waiting. He's anxious. Nothing He wants more than to pour out His Holy Ghost. So that everywhere you go, people want to talk about God. Everywhere you go, suddenly, you talk about God, and where people used to laugh, walk away, there'll be 10 or 12 gather around. Everywhere, the Lord begins to open the doors because the raindrops start falling. Second, not intimidated by any sinner. You're never intimidated by anybody who looks too hard, sounds too hard, or smells too hard. Say, my God's able to do anything. Not intimidated by the darkness or by the fury of wicked sinners. Let them stay mad. Because when the rain starts falling, you watch what happens. Those who are angry and screaming are going to break down and be broken and weeping. When they see that which is coming upon the face of the earth. Oh, hallelujah. 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 You ready to pray for rain down? Not fire of judgment, but rain. The judgment's coming. Yes, it is. It's at the door. So while we still have time, we're going to believe God. Hallelujah. Folks, I haven't had time to run this by Pastor Carter yet or our staff. But I slipped out of the service for a few moments, went back in prayer. Holy Spirit was speaking to my heart that sometime in the spring, April, May, I don't know, I feel the Lord wants us to have a month-long revival. Every night but Monday, Saturday night included. And the only guest speaker would be the Holy Ghost. Just the pastors and the Holy Ghost. And a whole month where we pray for a great harvest of souls. We just stand up and deliver what God tells us from our heart, but a whole month. How many of you are ready and willing to come to God's house every night but Monday for a whole month? Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Balcony, the main floor. How many are willing to invite your family, your sons and your daughters and your family this whole that whole month? Let's all stand. Let everybody stand. Folks, I, I believe God's about, everything we've been praying for is about to break forth. The Holy Ghost has come. Hallelujah. If you can't sense that, you don't know Him. If you've been walking with Him, you can tell it. And say, oh God, don't pass my family by. And you know what, you know what, if you have children here in this church, just children that are in children's church, any, anyone from toddlers up, will you ask God in this time, the next five or six months while God's moving?